our brains are wired to keep us comfortable, right? And so we want to create that safe, comfortable routine, go to the same places for vacation, go to the same places for lunch, go to the same job with the same coworkers, doing the same things and everything feels safe. And then the brain's like, nothing new to write down here. And when it doesn't write anything down, time accelerates and 98% of adults the world over all cultures feel that time accelerates the older you get. But I'd say a good portion of adults aren't willing to take the kind of the risks to put themselves out there to create the kind of unique experiences that lead to the kinds of memories that are have it before and after. And so then time keeps speeding up. We trade time for money, but there comes a point where it's really time to start trading money for time. Hello, and welcome to the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Linda Ulrich, and I'm also founder of the mothership website of this podcast over at the Goodness Exchange. There is an enormous wave of goodness and progress happening in the world right now that almost no one knows enough about yet. And we're going to shine a light on that right here on the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast. So today we're going to speak to an amazing guest who's going to help us understand and appreciate the passage of time and improve our experience with that. Today's guest, John Coyle, is a well-known speaker, author, and an Emmy award-winning sports feature producer, and one of the world's leading experts in design thinking and innovation. His his stated mission is to innovate the human experience. He is also the founder and CEO of an organization called The Art of Really Living, which is really more like a movement and a philosophy where the mission is to help people live lives full of memorable experiences and therefore help us live a more memorable life, like we're living forever. John's fresh perspective and his book called Design for Strengths has led John to be featured in Fast Company, Strategy Plus Business, and Playboy Magazine. In this episode of the podcast, we're going to explore John's observations about the science-based knowledge of how we perceive time passing and how we improve how we experience time passing. As a little side note, John is also very familiar with the passage of time measured by milliseconds. Um, he is also <laughs> a short track speed skater and was part of the 1994 silver medal winning relay team in the Winter Olympics. So, John, thank you for joining us here on the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast. You bring a level of knowledge with an engineering degree from Stanford that we always appreciate and a level of experience and these insights. I think your level of curiosity is one of the things that impressed me the most. Welcome, John Coyle. Thank you, Linda. It's glad I'm glad to be here. John, I'm going to start with a with something you said in our pre-interview that just takes us right off onto this path immediately. You said, when life gives you choices, choose the one that gives you the best stories. So help us understand um, where you're coming from and and why should why do we want more more stories? Well, I mean, we could do a long history background, but let's just start with 50,000 years ago when there was no written language. And for about 45,000 of those 50,000 years, everything that we learned was passed down in the oral tradition. And as we've learned, as things finally started getting codified, those stories all followed a set pattern of storytelling that we now see in movies and, and, and major books and everything else today. And so stories, we're hardwired for stories from this 50,000 year evolution of our brains. And so when you go somewhere, when you do something, if you create a story while doing so, well, then you're going to remember it because we are hardwired to remember stories. We don't remember facts. We don't remember data. We don't remember analytics, but remember stories. And here's the hard part, the part that people don't really like, but is that, you know, and I'll just do the analysis. All stories have a plot. All plots have a crisis. If you don't have a crisis, you don't have a plot. If you don't have a plot, you don't have a story. If you don't have a story, they're not going to remember it. Therefore, you need some crises yeah. in your life. Okay. So how does that all tie back to this problem that I hear and I know I experience myself? Most of us experience this sense that time is just zipping along, just right. passing us by day after day, week after week. How does what you just told us about how our brains work connect with that idea that time slips by so fast? Well, uh, the reason that time seems to be slipping by so fast, and it's not really true, right? Like there's still 7,884,000 7, right. seconds in a summer, save it, same as when you were eight. However, but the way our brains are wired is our brains are wired in a way to keep you alive and keep you procreating. And so our sense of time actually is built upon our 
the memories we create. And it's really three things. Were they created in the first place? How deep are they? How broad are they? And how recallable are they? So it's really four things. And the thing about memories are, is for adults, when everything is safe, routine, and comfortable, the brain is very lazy and it says, I don't need to write this down. Now, when you're eight, everything is exciting. Everything is scary. Everything is new. And so, you know, eight-year-olds cry a lot. They laugh a lot. They have a really wide range of experiences and emotional experiences. And so the brain is writing everything down like this, but the, de- the memory bank they create is super thick and super deep. And so summer lasts forever when you're a kid now feels like it's a fleeting moment as an adult. Right. So the more memories you have, the more your perception of more time that you have. Yes. The more memories that are recallable that you have, okay. the longer it seems like this week, this month, this year, this hour feels. And, and it's all about memory. It's not about your experience in the present. This is where it gets a little mm-hmm. confusing because long, slow, boring days might feel like forever in the present, right? If you're just plodding through some paperwork or something. But in memory, that disappears to nothing. Contrast that with the first day of vacation. And that feels like it's in you know fast motion. Mm-hmm. And so you're zooming through your day and you get to the airport and you go to the beach and you have a cocktail and you walk the beach and you have a dinner and you read some books and you, you spend some time with your partner, you splash in the ocean, whatever. But the day after that memory expands and you can zoom in and slice color action, slow motion, because you've stored so much on that first day of vacation. And that's just the way the brain works. When it's interested, when it's involved, when it's super focused, it's going to store tons and tons of memories, which then add to your data bank and think of it as a yardstick, like, the more memories you have, the longer your life is. And, and the particular kinds of memories, which we'll get into at some point, are the ones that have the before and after. You know, if you think about the, the yardstick, like where the halfway point is, is a thicker line than the other points and the small points in between. And so the more of these tick marks you have in life where there's a before and after, mm-hmm. s- simply that's the longer you live. And, and no joke, I'm 20 years into 2023. <laughs> Well, I tell you, that makes me think that, am I right in thinking that we have to live like out there on the edge of our comfort zone to create these memories that are worth telling stories about? Like you and I talked about how my husband and I have been dragging our kids all over the planet to strange places all our lives. And the stories we tell about almost sleeping under the car in the Andes or whatever, they come from moments where I was pretty fearful as a mother or, or that we were, I was way out of my comfort zone. So is what you're saying is the uh, ordinary person way to say that, Hey, we got to get out, out of our, out of our. Yes. I mean, the the adage is correct that life begins at the end of your comfort zone. That's really talking about memory creation. First though, let me, let me address the, the big elephant in the room. You can't live like that all the time. Right. right. You can't be sleeping under the van every night. The, the people that do that, their lives are completely out of control. And we are, <laughs> all of us know somebody like that. I shoot for one of these eventful moments a month because then you return home, you nest, you're fully safe. Everything's protected. You recover and then you're ready for the next adventure. But here's what the brain does. So the brain, by the way, is 3% of your mass and 28% of your calorie burn. So it's like a giant light bulb on the top of your head. It is working really hard. And the hardest thing the brain does is write memories. So if it doesn't have to, it won't. So if you ever found yourself in the parking garage and you didn't know how you got there, the brain's like, well, nothing new here to write down. So it doesn't write anything down. I would argue you're dead for that commute because if you can't remember it, it didn't happen. Now, what gets interesting is when there's some uniqueness, some, some, some risk involved, some emotional intensity to what you're doing, like sleeping under the van in the Andes, yeah. the heart, then the brain... Well, so the hippocampus is the memory writer. Just think of it making a photograph every few seconds. So it, your brain and my brain right now, because we're not under duress, are writing a photograph every two to three seconds. We hold up to five or six, but we live literally in moments. There, We can't store more than six or seven seconds okay. of present tense memory and short-term memory. And then it's written to the parietal lobe and all over in long-term memory. Now, what gets interesting is when there's a stress, when there's some risk, when there's some uniqueness, when there's some beauty, when there's some emotional intensity the amygdala tells the hippocampus write faster. So now it's writing 20 memories per second. So your frame rate goes up by 50, 60 X. And this is why time seems to slow down in a car crash or that first kiss or what have you, where things are intense. And that's when the brain is storing memories. And by the way, amygdala driven memories rise to the top of that stack of photographs. So they're highly recallable. Now this is good and bad. It means you're always going to remember when you proposed or didn't. It's means you're always going to remember that you got off the exit or you didn't. It means you always remember you rammed into that car or you didn't. Right. 
But the bad part is you're going to remember all the bad memories just as well as you're going to remember the good ones. But if you can design a life to have more good ones than bad ones, your ratio flips in your favor. So that's something to remember is that we, you know, you got, it's that, it is that edge, right? Like not too far out there. But you don't this, want to die. Yeah. You don't <laughs> want to die. That's what I was just going to say. Like you, you want to have some memories that, that leave you the impression, like never do that again. Right. <laughs> Which may or may not be the right message to, to, to take away from some things. Yeah. Okay. So if we have this understanding, what's the shortest way you can help us understand how memories actually work so we can move on to this, this part of your insights that's about creating really good ones? So you've got this part of your brain called the hippocampus, which is constantly writing memories. Yes. And then you've got the amygdala, which I'm always telling people the negative news is, mm. is engaging, right? The part that's looking for danger and disorder. Right. And they interact in such a way that we record experiences in a, in a way that we can retrieve really fast. Yes. Is that a good That's way to exactly say That's exactly right. So the amygdala, by the way, is quiescent a lot of the time, at least when it comes to memory writing. It does other functions, but when it comes to memory writing, it prefers to be quiet because it's a very intense, most intense process that the brain does is writing memories. If you think about it, you're storing all this information mm -hmm. for the rest of your life. Like how hard is that? Right? So It'll be quiescent and do nothing, but it wakes up for two things, as you started to mention. Never do that again or always do that again. The never do that again is don't die. And the always do that again, which gets back to car crash first kiss, is stay alive long enough to procreate. So this is why our memories are particularly intense about near-death experiences or love experiences. Because the, the, the our brains are wired to keep us alive, to procreate and keep our species going in the future. And so... Amygdala-driven memories are faster, deeper, broader, and more highly recallable than regular memories. And so how do you trick the brain into creating more of these without killing yourself? That's really what we're talking about here. And that's, you know, that's international travel. Without fail, yes. when you're overseas and something goes wrong and you find yourself in this dead-end alleyway and then you find this beautiful piece of art or a sculpture or fountain and you're like, oh my God, I'm so glad I got lost, right? That's... That's the perfect moment where the brain is fully awake and alive. That point right there. Oh my God, I'm so glad that. When we can say that after something that took us out to the edge of our comfort zone, that to me makes her a rich life and a rich storytelling history, don't you think? Oh my, if after the fact we can say, oh my gosh, I'm right. so glad that. Can I tell you a story to illuminate that? Sure, please. So, you know, I've been aware of this brain function. I've been researching this for over 10 years. And one of my pieces of advice is that you should, and I'm saying this sort of aggressively intentionally, but that you should design fear and suffering into your vacations. Oh, I love that point. And so the story I'll tell you is that my daughter and I, were, I was flying, I was speaking in Playa del Carmen seven years ago now, and she was 14 at the time. And so it was all first class fare. They picked us up in the Escalade, went nice. to all inclusive five-star resort. We had a pool on our prop in our room, basically. And we could have just stayed there and had cocktails and kitty cocktails. But, you know, I'm not going to do that. So I say to my 14-year-old daughter, hey, do you want to walk to town along the beach? And she's on to me. So she's suspicious. And she's like, well, how far is it? And I think it's about an hour. So I said, I think it's about an hour. So we leave about 4 o'clock. And the sun's starting to set. It's beautiful. And the water's all lit up. We start to see a starfish. We see some manta rays. Everything's great. And we walk for an hour. And she's like, are we almost there? And I'm like, I think so, but I don't really know. And then we walk for another hour. And now we're two hours in. And then the sun does that thing. It drops into the waters in the ocean. Now it's dark. And the sand turns to coral. And we're only wearing flip-flops. And now our feet are bleeding. She's crying. There's bonfires over there. And we walk for another hour. It's three hours in. We don't want to go three hours back. But we keep going. Now it's four hours in. And we finally see the lights the town we are starving hungry hot thirsty like we are miserable and as we smell the foods of avenue five and playa del carmen she says to me fiercely this is going to be the best dinner of my life and it could have been a hot dog it would have been it wouldn't have mattered but i remember we sat at the corner of this argentinian restaurant and this wooden table and they served us our appetizers which was a goat cheese stuffed squid with a light white wine lemon butter sauce with some parsley on top seven years ago i can still see it because that was the story right that was a story. And we could have sat by the pool, kitty, kitty cocktails, and we would have gone home and have said, how was your vacation? Good. But mm. instead, we had a story. And, the part, and there's a part of that that you would be able to say, I'm so glad that. Right. I'm so yes. glad that we suffered through that to have that incredible meal that I still remember like it's in front of me seven years later. 
wonderful. Wow. That is so great. Okay. All right. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to have John help us understand this notion of why time does feel like it's speeding by and how we slow it down. You know how the constant negative noise in our digital lives feels like it's reaching a boiling point? Now, many of us have tuned out the news and social media almost entirely. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. There are newsworthy stories about amazing progress, innovation, leaps in human potential, and wonders in the natural world, and they're just not reaching the top of our feeds. We can have access to this, but none of us has the time or maybe even the emotional stamina to search through all the doom and gloom news to find what's right with the world. Okay, enter the goodness exchange. There, we are giving instant access to positive news for curious people. Did you hear about the recent Harvard study that found that exposure to just four minutes of good news can make you 32% less anxious and 18% more optimistic? Well, I don't know about you, but I need those kind of numbers in my life. So if you want to live with more joy and way less fear, it's really simple. First, you join us at the Goodness Exchange. Everyone around the world has the opportunity to access this kind of content. And we've promised no politics for about a decade, so you're safe from all that distraction as well. Second, you allow this new, more positive, balanced worldview to put a spring in your step again. It can change the way you react to your kids, your coworkers, everybody you come in contact with. And the stories we write about can make you the idea person in your circles. These challenging times call for us to wake up and take control of our perspective. The people who use the Goodness Exchange have the ability to react to the harshness of the world much different because they know way more about what's right with the world. And that's a resource. So subscribe to The Goodness Exchange, our YouTube channel and the podcast, and use this content to live a more expansive worldview. It is still an amazing world out there, and you can be a part of it. Welcome to The Conspiracy of Goodness. Okay, we're back with John Coyle, an expert in how we live our lives in a, in ways that make us feel like we're living lives that last forever. So what's the actual science of why we feel like time is speeding by? Like, help us understand that first, and then tell us the story of your mother and her purchase. Well, you know, I was I was an Olympic athlete, and, and during that period, the trajectory of your career as an athlete hinged on literally hundreds of seconds, right? Mm -hmm. As as Seinfeld put it, let's see if I can do it. Gold, silver, bronze, never heard of it. Which is actually true, right? Fourth place, nobody knows. Nobody knows. You have no future in sports, no recognition post your career. And what I realized as I retired from sport at age 30 is that that's actually true in real life, that our lives hinge on moments, not minutes, not months, not years. Like, everything that we do that's important for our future trajectory hinges on literally a moment. And this is the way the brain works, right? The the hippocampus is writing moments to the back brain. And so the the Greeks in their infinite wisdom actually figured this out 2000 years ago. They had two words for time. We only have one, by the way, in English, time is the most common word other than a and and the. We overuse it. We try to make it work too hard. They had two, kairos and chronos. Chronos is clock time, the way we use it, trains, planes, automobiles, getting to meetings on time. Kairos, the word they use 67% of the time in Greek texts, uh, is human time. So the way we actually experience time, which speeds up and slows down, it does not follow the clock. And we ignore that reality all the time. It's like the flat earth society. Like in no way is time linear the way we experience it. And so Kairos, the etymology or the meaning, the deep meaning in the etymology is when everything happens at once and the trajectory is reset and it's the archer releasing the arrow. And so this is the way our lives move. We move from moment to moment, it might be next month, it might be next year, but then there's that moment where you decided to say yes or you didn't, you had a baby or you didn't, took the promotion or you didn't, you moved or you didn't, like all these big things. They might take years to build up to it, but there's a decision that happens in literally seconds that changes the future of your life. And the Greeks figured this out so long ago. So, you know, how do you design these kinds of moments in your life? And so my father started moving into dementia. And my mother's like, I want to create moments for him while we still have him. And so she was visiting here, me here in Vegas, and she sees this weird contraption. She's like, what is that? 
I'm like, that's a Polaris. It's a slingshot. It's a three wheeled motorcycle, essentially. And my parents used to be motorcyclists. And she's like, I'm getting one. I'm going to take your dad around in it while I still can. And that afternoon, she went and purchased a slingshot at age 80 and proceeded to drive my dad around here in Las Vegas and then drove it all the way to Salt Lake with him. And then for, you know, a year and a half until he was no longer able to amble to the car, would take him around, take him up to the mountains, do all the motorcycling things they used to do wow. while his brain was able to take it in. And so she created memories for him, you know, that were indelible. That is just super. So there's probably some version of that aspirationally for all of us out there. You know, that's true. And this is where things get a little bit uncomfortable is our brains are wired to keep us comfortable, right? And so we want to create that safe, comfortable routine, go to the same places for vacation, go to the same places for lunch, go to the same job with the same coworkers, doing the same things, and everything feels safe, comfortable with the gauze of Advil, Paxil, air conditioning, like everything, everything in life is safe and comfortable. And then the brain's like, nothing new to write down here. And when it doesn't write anything down, time accelerates. And 98% of adults, the world over all cultures, feel that time accelerates the older you get. And this is not fair and it's not right and it's not okay. But between you and me and you're doing it and I'm doing it, but most, I'd say a good portion of adults aren't willing to take the kind of the risks to put themselves out there to create the kind of unique experiences that lead to the kinds of memories that have it before and after. And so then time keeps speeding up. And, you know, we trade time for money. We all do this and, and we should. But there comes a point, particularly probably around our ages, where it's really time to start trading money for time mm -hmm. and creating those experiences. And then the last thing, which I know we'll get into later, but this isn't just about for you, right? You can design the kinds of experiences that have a before and after for people you love, for the people you work with, like for anybody around you. And that's super fun. That trading time for money and then money for time, that is a really powerful insight that we that we probably skip right over pretty fast. I have, you know, I work, you know, in the speaking I do, I mean, let's just be honest, like it's wealthy people to hire me because yeah. otherwise I have to speak for free because you can't afford me. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm working with these CEOs and, and executives of large companies or, or wealthy entrepreneurs. And what I hear again and again is they have no time. Now, I'm okay with that when they're 28. I'm not okay with that when they're 42 or 45 or 55 or 65. And one of the things that, you know, we didn't talk about the last time we talked, but I have, for some reason, I have several friends that are matchmakers for the wealthy. Yeah. And they're like, these guys can't, they can't for their lives have a, a life partner because they're, or gals. Right. Gals too. Because yeah. um, they're so busy and they, they, they can't, can't. I love that word. Make time for finding somebody. Yeah. And I'm like, what are they doing all this for if it's not right. to have somebody to share with? I mean, not everybody wants to have a life partner, but I think a vast majority do. And I, I will, I will, I will say this is you haven't had to talk about this, but I became single a year and a half ago, and my first priority was to find somebody I could spend my life with. Okay, you've got to tell the story of the, what was it, 81 dates? 112 <laughs> first dates in one year. Okay, yeah, talk to us about that. Because it's a great, it's a great story that, that we could all like pay attention to and find an analogy in our own life, something that we're doing this. Go ahead, share could that Could I have made though. more money in the last year if I was focused on just building the business? Yes, I could have. Did I have enough coming in to focus on what's really important? Yes, I did. And so I chose to spend my time going on 112 first dates probably only like 30 second dates, probably only like 23rd dates. And I think it was only four fourth dates. After all that, most of that was internet dating or not internet, but app dating. And then I'm in the gym in my building one day and I literally walk in and I'm like, that's her. And this woman had been living directly nine feet below me for two and a half years. And I had only just met her and she moved in a month ago. So Wow. So we do spend a lot of time putting our shoulder against doors that aren't opening easily. Yes. There will be an interview on the Goodness Exchange here with a, a with an amazing Nat Geo photographer named DeWitt Jones, who has the famous TED Talk called Celebrate with What's Right with the World. And mm -hmm. I'll make sure that link is in the show notes. But that's one of the things he learned. He taught me years ago. I became friends with him and he was kind enough to spend three hours with me on the phone one day while he was waiting in an airport. And I never forgot that lesson is that we have to start recognizing the doors that are opening easily because our time is so precious. Right. So 
I mean, there's a whole other talk that I do, but I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. So I was at Stanford my senior year studying engineering full-time, a lot of credit hours, and I still managed that year to get 12th place in the world of short of speed, uh, the sport of short track speed skating. So I was pretty sure that by graduating and joining the Olympic team full-time, I would go from 12th to 6th to 1st. But I got to the Olympic Training Center and they put me in a path immediately of banging my head against doors, which said differently is fixing my weaknesses, which is good for kids. Kids don't know what they're good at. They, they, they'll quit anything in two minutes. Like fixing weaknesses, it's a fine sport for you until you're roughly 20 or so. Uh, but as the saying goes, if you're over 20 and you're still trying to fix your weaknesses, that ship has sailed. So banging your shoulder against doors starts to become a, a, a really negative sport for almost all adults. And so they put me in this path of fixing my weaknesses. And I went from 12th in the world to 34th in the world to not making the team two years later, finishing 30th in the US trials that I had won two years prior and I was ready to quit. And if, the, if we had slides up, I would show you a man banging his head against a brick wall. And then I would back up and I would show that same frame. And the brick wall is literally this big. And there's just simply an easier way around this. And we didn't have to go through the brick wall. We could find a way around or open a different door. And that's leaning into your strengths, your natural talent. So I quit the team, not the sport. I started training on my own back the way I used to. And I designed a way of training and technique to leverage what I'm, I do well, opening the easy doors. And a year to the day later of not making the team, I show up at the same meet, same people, same competition, where I was getting killed a year before. And in my first race back in a sport where hundreds of seconds determined first from second, I broke the U.S. record by five and a half seconds, the world record by over a second. I set what? every single U.S. record back, back to back because I leaned into the opening, the easy doors. So I think this ties back to that taking up, being able to take a little bit of risk too. Right. Right. Like, yeah. Nobody wanted me to do that. Right. right. The, the safe choice was to keep plugging away, doing the thing, what everybody else told me to do. And I'm rebellious enough, just enough to say, no, I'm not going to do that. I won't do it. I'm not going to do it anymore. It's not working. And that was a really hard choice. And my parents, God bless them, were really the only people that supported me, but that was enough. And so I went off and did my own thing and it worked. By the way, when you get into the flow state, and that's a whole nother talk, but if flow state is the peak performance zone, it's when you're in the zone, when you're doing things that where time stops or disappears, that's the way I felt starting to train this way. So I kind of knew it was going to work. I had an intuition it was going to work. By the way, when you're in the flow state, you not only have, if you're the amygdala is awake, because you're in my case, I'm breaking away. So now amygdala is awake because this is risky. Right. But I'm in the flow zone. That multiplies your memory writing by four or five X. So instead of 60 times more memories per minute, you're now getting 300. If you have 300 times more memories per minute, you don't live 50 more years. You literally live 5,000 more years or at least equivalent of, you know, a thousand years. This is an important concept also because one of the things I've learned in my, my husband and I, some of our listeners know, or have been dentists for 30 years. And we have a really deeply relationship oriented practice. So we know our patients, we know their vacations and their lives and their, their ups and downs. And, and one thing that that closeness to 3000 lives has taught me is how short life actually yeah. is. Like the, every week I'm head on the desk, sobbing, writing a condolence note to someone for the darndest things. Right. Right. The, the, the guy who doesn't know he's allergic to bees and gets a bee sting at a park and right. has three kids and dies instantly, or I could go on and on. So, um, so this passage of time to me, like honoring the passage of time and figuring out the insights of folks like you so that we can live better with the, our remaining time, that, that may be the most critical point here, right? I mean, for me, I feel like it's the greatest gift we can give ourselves and others is to expand time so that this fleeting existence we have on Earth is not so fleeting. And in the process, and we, we should get into that, is how do I gift the gift of time to others? How do that I was gonna create be my, yes. memorable moments for others? That was going to be my next question, because one of the things you talked to me about was something you called time dilated experiences can be gifted to others. Right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Share that whole angle with us. I mean, so we've been talking about, you know, doing it for yourself, which is important. I think, you know, you got to invest yourself first, put your mask on first, but we have kids, we have partners, we have friends, we have sisters, brothers, loved ones, and we're leaders, we're followers. Like there's a whole host of people around us that we can start to think about creating moments for as well. And, you know, the, the, the initial thought process might be like, these things cost money and they can, and they should, 
because you're trading your money for time and that's okay. And you should, you know, it's like, you probably heard the story. It's like, you know, this one couple, they saved up for, you know, six months to have one meal at some fancy restaurant. Right, right, right. And I'm like, absolutely they should. Yes. Like, because they're going to remember that dinner more than remember the six months of meals that it took to save up for it. But I'll give you two examples, one free, one expensive. I'll do the expensive one first. A client of mine, CEO of a company, heard my talk. And then he, he wrote me a few months later and he's like, you know, I got home and I was like, you know, my son's turning 12. We live in Australia, but... I'm from London and we've been following a London footballer club, soccer club for, you know, seven years. And my son wears their jerseys and he's been watching every game. He's super enthusiastic. And so I was like, for his 12th birthday, I'm going to fly him to London. I'm not telling him what we're doing or where we're going. So we get on a plane. He doesn't know where we're going. We land in London and he knows where we are. He's like, why are we here? here, dad? I don't tell him. We get in the bus. We go to the stadium. He now he knows where he's at. He's super excited. But then... They get off the bus, they start to walk towards the stadium. Out of the side door comes the entire team of his favorite football club because he paid for his son to be the mascot. They put him in the jersey, they put him on the field, he warms up with them, he watches the game with them, he sits with them afterwards, he goes in the locker room, they sign his jerseys, right? His dad created this moment. And dad can't talk about this without crying, so I'm not sure who got more out of it, the son or the dad, but this was a paid for moment. Love and it. it's worth it. Now, but they can be free too. My business partner, Monica, a couple of years ago, there was a Ple uh, Pleiades, a media shower, anyways. And it's at school night, and it's July, and it's like 2 a.m. And she wakes each of her sons up, 11 and 13 at the time, Doesn't tells them not to say a word. They grab two blankets. They walk up on the hill by their house, and they watch these smoke trails and brilliant lights of these meteors entering the atmosphere, which is astonishing. Five, six, seven minutes, probably only. Second son, same thing. Indelible memory. Completely free. And we can design these for others. And eventually I'll tell you the one that changed my life, but we'll get there. Well, I tell you, I think that we don't know when we're changing somebody else's life a good bit of the right. time either. Like, I love this, that, that we, I, I don't think we have to feel guilty about paying for memorable experiences and, mm. and it doesn't have to be something that probably costs who knows hundreds of thousands of dollars, like the example you gave, but just saving up for some memorable experience. Those are lovely and then then what you talked about that are the freebies i mean i don't think there's really any difference if you're out on your comfort out on the edges of your comfort zone and you're living something that's a story you'll tell the rest of your life it, it, it's all the same and all the same it's all, the all same. something to be celebrated right it's just easier to design yeah. the expensive ones yeah <laughs> if that makes sense yeah but if you're you know if, as and this is you know for your listeners the more you start becoming aware of opportunities to create a memorable moment, the more you'll jump on those. And, and they will often look like, and this started with right where you started. Wait, there's a story here. Right. Okay. So then there are these occasions when we almost miss a memorable moment because right. our, where our priorities are not in the right place. Tell us that, that that's a great reminder story that you have on that topic. So I'll tell two quick stories. So I was invited to be part of the torch run for the 96 Atlanta games as a Olympic medalist. And they were very excited for me to show up at 10 p.m. in outside of Detroit, Michigan, on a cold, dark, rainy night in the middle of summer on a Friday when I would rather be out with my friends because finally I'm free to actually go do something fun on a Friday because I've got, you know, some couple months off from training. And I didn't want to go. And then it was raining and it was delayed. And so it was at 10 a.m., 10 p.m., 11 p.m., midnight, and it's the pitch dark, and I'm just standing in these shorts, and I'm freezing, and then the torch runner that's before me comes and hands it to me, and I turn the corner, and unbeknownst to me, as the only or one of the few reigning Olympic medalists in the Detroit area, as I turned a the corner, there were 100,000 people lined up, screaming and cheering that stayed there for two hours in the rain to see the torch enter the city of Detroit, and I almost missed that because I almost left. Now, fast forward, different different story. I had mentioned that I was training for the next Olympics after my first one. And even though this sounds crazy, I identified for that next four years and then for the next four years after that as a one-timer first loser. So silver medal only, one Olympics, not good enough. Yeah, right. And then I missed the next games. And then the games after that, I got invited to be the NBC analyst, and I wasn't going to say no to that. So I'm invited to go back to the Olympics, the place I loved to be and wanted to be, but now not as an athlete. And so I'm still a one-timer first loser. But I get there, and my job is to interview the parents, coaches, and skaters. And so I'm doing that. And they all welcome me back. Everybody knew me, and I knew most of them. 
But on the 16th night of the 17 days of the Winter Olympic Games, a parent pulled me aside and created a Kairos moment that changed the entire trajectory of my life in about 20 seconds. So we're at, we're at dinner. It's the night before the gold medal round in my sport, which is always the final night, by the way. And he looks nervous as he pulls me aside. And he's like, I need to tell you something that's really important. So now I'm nervous because I don't know what's going on. And he said, I just want you to know that we wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for you. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And he's like, you won't remember, but 12 years ago, after you won your Olympic silver medal, you brought it to a little reception in Bay City, Michigan. I brought my son, Alex. He was 11 years old at the time. He'd never skated before in his life. The next day, he, after you signed an autograph and put your medal around his neck, he joined the Bay City Speed Skating Club. And tomorrow, he is skating in the gold medal final. Oh, my gosh. I just got goosebumps. Wow. What? Like, and everything for me changed in that moment. I went from a one-timer first loser to literally it's thinking, you know, a silver medal is not all that bad. And it changed everything I did. I started announcing, started coaching. I got my daughter skating. And most importantly, I started talking about it. By the way, this is all I do for a living now. And I've told this story now to more than a million people in more than 19 countries. And, you know, I wrote Al, the father, a letter that evening via email. And he waited three days till he got home from the Olympics. And he wrote me back and I won't share the whole thing, but he goes home. He looks at his son's, he goes to his son's bedroom. He looks at his bulletin board that still has a signed photo with my autograph on it. He goes downstairs. He prints, his, prints off a photo of me with his son, with his son's medal around my neck, which he won the very next night, Olympic medal, puts it back in the same Ziploc. And then he says, you know, I guess you'll never know what you'll do or say or not do or say that could change someone's life forever. And this is happening for you and me and everybody listening to this right now. And we won't know. We won't know in the moment. But right now we are creating Kairos moments all around us all the time. And we have to make sure we're present for those moments. Right. So we can't, I mean, this is, this is, you know, mind blowingly positive, but, and what I see happening in so many people's lives is that we're letting these devices steal our ability to be in the moment with others that where those exact things right. that we just talked about for the last 10 minutes would happen. Yeah. And we're never going to remember a darn thing that happened here. You have your own thoughts on that. Just share your own thoughts about the, about t the passage of time and technology and our phones and social media and all that. Yeah. I mean, there can be some, and there are some really good uses of social media. I'd say, I, you know, for me, keeping up with friends that are far and remote, yeah. I love it. Like I, I really am a fan of it for that because I can't see them all the time. But if I make it a proxy for seeing them ever, that starts to be a slippery slope, you know, right. it's not the same being in touch in present. And, you know, I'll make this analogy that I think everybody's experienced. You can have a business dinner with an acquaintance that you remember from like six months or a year ago, and you're struggling to remember how many kids they have and are they married? And what did we talk about last time? And you look at your watch after what seems like three hours and it's been 20 minutes. And you're like, dear Lord, this evening is going to last forever. <laughs> That's not what you want. Yes. Conversely, your best friend who lives in Australia, my case actually, and I only see him every few years and he comes to town and we sit down, we're eagerly talking. And we, by the way, one, one thing that's always true about best friends is you catch up, you, leave, you pick up right where you left off. Right, right, yeah. There is no time that passed. It right. doesn't matter if it's five years. No time has passed. There's a whole theory about this. But so now you're, you're talking in full steam ahead. And then you look at your watch, what seems like 20 minutes has gone by and it's been three hours. Yeah. And so this is the non-linear nature of how we experience time. But what we really want is time to be fast in the present because that means you're writing memories at a high frame rate. That's what right. we want. Right. And we get that when we spend quality time with the people we care about. That's right. Yeah. People and, experiences. And I, yeah. And I'm not sure that's happening when we're sitting in a restaurant and we've got our two little kids with us and we're both looking at our phones. No. Oh, that always pains me when I look around a restaurant and see that because right. we've had some but of the funniest. I will absolve all of us from some self-blame. You know, we do have work. We do have things we need to catch up on. Yeah. And so the whole quality time thing, I'm not, yes, no, like sitting with your kid every day while they do their homework, but you're on your phone, not sure that's that valuable, but your kid walks through the door and you see a look in their eyes and you know they need a hug. In two seconds, you can add more value than three weeks of the other yeah. stuff. And if you're awake and aware enough to be present for that moment, that moment is more important than everything else. And this, you know, everything we talked about, I'll summarize in one, one sentence. 
It's my entire life philosophy. It's the philosophy of the book. It's, it's the philosophy of everything. The value of an increment of time is not related to its duration. The value of an increment of time is not related to its duration. You can create more value in two seconds by hugging your teenager as she walks through the door and saying nothing than spending two weeks sitting there while she does her homework while you're on your phone. And then it's almost like emotional capital that starts building up with people if you're totally present with them, because then when you really need those moments, that that attention between the two of you, you've got a, a bank account of being present. Exactly. So, you know, you think yeah. about like the investment portfolio. And so I, you know, if I had yeah. a slide, I'd show you, but like on the X axis here would be linear time, how much time clock time is going by. Right. So yeah. more less. Right. But here is your returns on time. And so low investment of time, low return, that's routine stuff, low investment of time, low, re uh, sorry, high investment of linear time, low return. Hopefully we don't have much of that, but it could be your job. If you're a toll booth collector, for example, you still have, there's 168 hours a week. So that leaves you quite a bit of time to spend elsewhere. Uh, high investment of time, high return. Hopefully that's your job where you spend a lot of time or spending time with your kids. But then there's this sort of unicorn where the, the way up here on the low investment of time, high returns, you get this miraculous investment where you get a million X return on a moment. And if you can just do a couple of those with the people you love, then the rest of it's not going to matter. Right. If you've got that much emotional capital with the people around you, you can screw up day and left and right for days. And they're going to be like, but mom created that moment for me. And I'll always remember that. And she'll always be there for me when it counts. Yeah. You know, I have to share with you a little story in our audience. My husband was the dentist at the local nursing home years ago, mm -hmm. and he was walking down the hall and he looked at this in one of the rooms and there's a woman um, sitting in a rocking chair looking out the window. And she said, he said, oh, hi, June. How are you? And what are you up to? And she said, well, I'm just sitting here going through my rocking chair memories. So ever since that, we just thought that was such a beautiful way of phrasing those memorable moments yeah. that all our lives since then, and that was a good 25 years ago, we identify the rocking chair moments, like the really bad ones or the really good ones, or yep. whatever, but we say, oh, this will be a rocking chair moment. Okay. You talked about a book called Behave. Yeah. Tell us about that. That sounded like a really important book for us to just understand the scope of time and why all this matters. Yeah, it's by Robert Sapolsky. He's a PhD in neuroscience and endocrinology, which is hormones. And you know, if you know anything about brain science, like the brain doesn't control everything. Hormones in the brain together create, uh, I think, things that we call consciousness and help us to make decisions and, and everything else. And you know, this book takes a really longitudinal study through time, through history, to help us understand which parts of our current decision making, our current behaviors are based on relatively new novel things that are human based and how much of it comes from the past. And as it turns out, this is a really broad swath of behaviors that we have that we inherited from our primordial ancestors. And it's fascinating to know that, you know, there's things that we do that monkeys do that we think are so sophisticated. And, uh, you know, my favorite is this, this notion that monkeys have moral reasoning. Somebody, if it's not him, trains two bonobos to bring the entire bonobo tribe. They bring a pebble, they get either a carrot or an apple or a piece of apple. And then he trains them to do it in pairs. They can only get rewarded if they bring it in pairs. So they get, both get a carrot. They both get an apple. They prefer the apple significantly to the carrot, but they'll always take the reward regardless. And then he switches it up after they're all fully trained and says, oh, wait, here's an apple for you and a carrot for you. And I just, somebody found this. There's this amazing video of a similar experiment. It wasn't by Robert, but they show it on, on camera. Finally, when they switch it up, the carrot, well, the apple monkey drops it because he knows it's not fair. So he really wants to gobble it or she. Um, and then the other monkey is reaching through the glass and then throws it at the researcher. So they know what's fair, right? Fairness is not something that we are unique in the world of having. And so when you read this book, you can start to really, I think, I feel like I'm rarely supply, surprised by what people do by their behaviors anymore. So when we see even egregious things, it comes from the fight, flight, freeze response system in our amygdala and limbic system, where if you're super triggered, you're going to do all kinds of super dangerous, terrible things to other people because our ancestors had to fight, run away, or hide to survive. And that's very outdated wiring for us today. You know, what I loved about the notion that you're putting forward in that book is that we might get gain some self-awareness 
so that we can pause and ignore those 30,000 year old impulses. Yes. Right? I haven't ordered that book yet, but it's on my list. And I know it will help me pause and rethink the, my gut reaction to things. Yeah. I mean, Viktor Frankl, if you're familiar with Man's Search for Meaning, yeah. has, does a great job of 70 years ago, he figured out modern neuro, neuroscience. So we know that the, the frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex is very slow. It's very smart. It's very planful. It's very thoughtful. And it makes good decisions. But it's very slow. So it takes three tenths of a second for it to respond to stimulus. Back brain, limbic system, amygdala, reptilian brain, the critter brain, this, this part is old and very fast. And it's where our stress response system sits. So fight, flight, freeze uh, sits there and it takes three hundredths of a second. So right. if you don't take that deep breath, that's where your response is going to come from. And it's going to be one of those things, flight, hide, run away, or fight. And so that's perfectly fine if an ax murder is coming at you out of an alleyway, you're going to claw their eyes out, run away and hide in the dumpster. But if it's a coworker that says something snarky and you want to claw their eyes out, run away and hide in your cubicle, less adaptive. <laughs> so we need to take the deep breath, let this part catch up and make the wise decision. And so here's Viktor Frankl's amazing observation. In between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space lies your choice. And in your choice lies your growth and freedom. That space is three tenths of a second. If you take the deep breath and wait for this part to catch up, you're not going to claw your spouse's eyes out and run away and hide downstairs. You're going to say, wait a minute, honey, what caused you to say that? I love that concept. I have a TED talk that happened in the depth of the pandemic that I did for a, a group in India. And it was never, it was published, but never, ever promoted. And I'll put the link to that. It's called yeah. The Power of the Pause. Yeah. And I do end that talk with, with that exact story. We, because we've got to get that through our funny, thicker, thin heads. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that we have the power to determine our future in that pause, in that yes, just do. few milliseconds. All right. Another book you mentioned that I want to turn people on to, we've already kind of brushed into that, but talk to us about flow. I think yeah. the book that both you and I had come across, it's a 2008 book. I think it's called Flow, the Psychology of Optimal Experience by a name I cannot begin to pronounce. Uh, Michele Csikszentmihalyi. Uh, so he wrote the first book on flow. And then the, I think the sort of sequel, even though it's not by him, his friend of mine, Stephen Cutler, wrote The Rise of Superman. So those okay. two books work together, but it really okay. is the science of the flow state, the flow state being a very strange brain state consisting of theta waves and alpha waves and also a bunch of hormones. And so the flow state is this time and the most, by, by the way, uh, so peak performance zone, the zone, athletes call it by different names, musicians call it different names. We all have this experience though, where the hallmark of the zone and the the flow state is where time stops or speeds up or both. And so you're like, where, where did those three hours go? Yeah. Right. Or time stopped in that moment when I was talking to that woman, like when the first time I saw yes. my girlfriend in the gym, like I, that, that was, there was a before and after for that moment, totally the flow state. And what's interesting about the flow state is we get a whole dose of various different brain chemicals from the endocrine system when we enter it. And so we get epinephrine, then dopamine, then serotonin, then undonamide, and then oxytocin in that order, which as Stephen Cutler says, if we got all five of these in the amounts that we're getting them in the flow state, we'd be dead or drooling. But it's all <laughs> natural. And these are by, far, by, by the way, are the most addictive chemicals known, known to man. This is meth, coke, heroin, pot, and ecstasy all at once, or not at once, they're, they're actually in order. Um, but these things create what Cheek sent me high, Michaeli Cheek sent me high, called the state that all of us on this planet Earth have sought for our entire lives. So the flow state is this place we really want to get. And some people maybe never get there. I'm not sure. But athletes and musicians and people that are really good at doing their jobs get there regularly. And so when you're in the flow state, there's a multiplying effect on how we write memories. And so instead of 40, 50 times more memories per second under the stress of uncertainty, risk, or an interesting uniqueness, we now get two, 300 times more memory. And so if you can be in a flow state with a bit of risk, uniqueness, or beauty, or intensity, suddenly you're writing memories at a rate that will lead to a lifetime that feels like a thousand years. Let's not skip over that. What are those three points again? When you can be in the flow state, yeah, your best self, doing your best work, your best whatever it is, with some risk, uniqueness, or beauty, or intensity, then you stack all those things and you literally create time at a 300, 400x rate. Than you do when it's a boring, un unique day. So back to the very 
risk, uniqueness, and beauty. Okay, so we're seeking out risk, uniqueness, and beauty to create a better relationship with time. And that goes back to how we open this conversation, that when life gives you choices, choose the one that gives you the best stories. Correct. Risk, uniqueness, and beauty. So when we flirt on the edges with those, we're going to experience this level of flow, which probably stretches time. I don't know what the right wording would that would be. I like dilating, but you know, you don't want to dilute time. You want to dilate time, which is expanded well beyond its temporal boundaries. And so, you know, like this notion that you can create a moment that's worth minutes, worth month, worth, worth years. Like I always ask my audiences, is, is there a boring week of days you'd trade away to keep at a really important day? And everybody says, yes. And I'm like, all right, let's take it to the extreme. Is there a moment, a minute in your life that is so important you would trade it away an entire year to keep it? And people, will, you know, they pause and I'm like, let's invert that. What if you could create moments worth a year? What if you could do five of those a year? What if you could do 10 of those a year? If you can do 10 moments worth a year, a year, you don't live 50 more years, you live 500. And that's exactly and totally possible. Shall I tell you a quick story? Yeah. So I have this theory that I could get into the flow state, have beauty, uniqueness, and emotional intensity all in one thing. As a speed skater, as a cyclist, my job basically in life for two decades was to travel at high speeds, balancing and trying not to get killed by other people. And so I thought, hey, and turning only left, by the way. And so I decided to run with the bulls in Pamplona and I set myself up on a left-hand corner because, you know, I only turn left. And I was like, I know, I want to know how to do this. Like, this is very similar to my sport. So I'm going to be in the flow state. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be intense. It's going to be unique. And so they shot the firework at 8 a.m. and everybody started running like crazy. And, but there's no bulls. They don't teleport. I'm 600 meters away from there where they're coming out. And then that slows to a trickle of scared looking people. And then there's a whole nother mass of people running, looking scared, looking behind them. And they're running into me and I'm fighting them off. And I'm near this barrier on the left-hand side. And then we see them, these giant bulls, 1,300 pounds, horns down, angry, their muscles heaving, their tails wagging. And next to them are six deers. They're 1,800 pounds. They run horns up. They're there to keep the bulls a little bit docile. And they're coming directly at me on this corner because they're going to make this left-hand turn and they're running at 18 miles an hour. And everybody's trying to pull me over the barrier and I'm fighting them off because I came to run with the bulls, not near the bulls or away from the bulls. And then a couple bulls and a couple steers pass me and then I see a spot and I drop down from the barrier and I'm just chasing this wagging tail. And I see the shiny hooves, I see the muscles heaving and I'm like, as long as I stay close to this tail, I'm good because the horns behind me will keep a safe distance. We move into the plaza. All these people that have been running before are now milling about and running over the edges and a total mess. And then there's a 12 foot tunnel down into the stadium and everybody's running and they're windmilling. And I see it all in slow motion because I've seen this all before. I know how this goes down in a bike crash or a speed skating crash. So I know where to be. I know where to position my feet. And I'm just following the tail in front of me and I see the hooves doing this. And I'm like, as long as the bull behind me is as good at slowing down as this one, I'm fine. And we move through this narrow tunnel of humanity that piled up on either side. And I run into the stadium. They slam the doors behind me. 25,000 people are on their feet. I stand in the center with my arms up because I just did the thing I thought I could do. That entire thing took 17 seconds. (laughs) 17 seconds. But I'll tell you, it's a lifetime. And then you got to count the time that you've relived the experience. Right. How many times have I told that story? Because it's a story and it's living at the edge of your comfort zone and the value of an increment of time is not related to its duration. That was 17 seconds worth worth at least a year. Wow. This is huge. And as we kind of buy into this consumer society, keeping up with the Joneses and stuff, we sort of forget that experiences are not things. Right. This is something you say. Talk to us about that. I literally had this conversation, in-depth conversation with this about last night. Some things can be experienced delivery mechanisms, right? So I have a bunch of bikes. They're things, but I use them to ride to create experiences. My girlfriend was telling me about some woman that has like 40 pairs of gym shoes of each color in a big like display. I'm like, those are things, right? There's no way she's using all 40 of those. That's a thing. That's for other people to look at. And I think that's material and, and, and an incorrect way to live your lives. Cause I think it's about people and experiences, not things. It's in fact, my Facebook motto is it's uh, experiences, not things, but some things can be experienced at delivery mechanisms. For example, collecting cars. If you're a wealthy guy and you collect cars, probably things, 
But if you're Jay Leno, where you're totally invested in the history of each vehicle and how to keep it running correctly and how to sh share your experience with us, that starts to become an experience, totally an experience for him. So experience is not things. Some things are experiences. That is such a good point. I think if we examine what we do spend our time and money on through that lens right there, experiences are not things, but sometimes they, they bring us to a level of joy and wonder and slow down the passage of time because we are so passionate about that thing. Right. Like but, I do have, I have a nice car. It's a convertible. Perfect example. Like I love driving the convertible and I get perfect to do it like example. eight months a year here in Vegas. And so that thing has become an experience delivery mechanism for me. But as you, I think, you know, I sold everything I owned two and a half years ago to move into an RV when COVID hit, because I was not about to sit home and just hunker down. Right. And boy, I don't, I had such a hard time like parting with objects and selling them or giving them away at the time. Guess how much I think about all that stuff I got rid of? Zero. Really? I literally haven't missed a single thing that I got rid of. And it's so weird that I was so agonizing, so hard over getting rid of all that stuff. So maybe that's a good stepping off point when we try and think about parting with things is whether there's experiences attached to them. Right. And, right. and future experiences too. Like, you know, we can't just live in the past at all. And the times. other judgment I made, and this is probably related to the, the woman, I forget her name that talks about this, but can I buy it again? Like some vintage speakers, for example, that I was yeah. really anchored to because I bought them in, when I was in college and I really was attached to them and they were hard to find. And I was like, there's eBay now. I go, I, you know, eBay it real quick. I'm like, oh, there's six sets of them out there right now. So off they go. You know, I had a convertible then that I had owned for 26 years. And I, that was my, actually my hardest decision. But I was like, am I going to store it? Is somebody going to start it? Who's going to keep it running? Like I'm going to be long gone. And then I put it up for sale and this young kid, he was 18. He's like, I'm going to restore her. I'll send you pictures. I'm like, that's even better than what I'm going to do. Cause I will get like a running history of where this car goes in the future. And I wouldn't have been taking care of it nearly as well as him. So again, I didn't miss anything I got rid of. Yeah. It's lovely. Okay. So all these concepts are little, are sort of nipping away at the edges of what we spend our time on that probably makes life just speed by so fast. You know, right. the upkeep of things that we don't really need. Right. Oh, talk to me about Saturday mornings, just putting things back where they belong. <laughs> Why did we have them in the first place? That's a whole right. other question. So when you really try and wrap this whole thing up, if this interview had been just three minutes, you know, you and I have both probably been interviewed on the news where we've got to get some major points said in three minutes, which always just is almost an impossible thing for me. But if we had only had three minutes to talk about this, I'm sure that there is something that you really wish people knew, John about the passage of time or about how we can live our lives feeling like life lasts forever. Share with us what you really wish people knew. I really wish people could get past this. And I'll make the analogy, this flat earth society view that the time as we experience is linear and that each second is equal to the last. That's a complete misnomer in the way we experience time. Time speeds up and slows down. And the way we experience time is very, very much related to the experiences we are in. And if you can design the kinds of experiences where the brain wants to write them down and make them highly recallable and they're good, important facet, uh, you can live not 50 more years if you're 40. You can live 500 more experiential years. And if you can do that, what a rich, fulfilling, full life you can have. And then you have more time to create those experiences for others as well. That's beautiful. And I have to ask, is this just happening in our personal life? Like, for instance, a lot of people will be to this point in our interview and they'll be thinking, oh, I got the most boring job in the whole world. <laughs> so eight and a half hours a day. We are in these situations that feel kind of mindless after you listen to an interview like right. this. But I think we have more control in our everyday work environments than we think over either creating memories for ourselves or others. Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, for sure. I mean, we have so much agency. Yeah. in our work lives. One of the favorite things I used to do when I used to work in corporate is I would write handwritten notes that I would put into an envelope with no name. And they would be nice things. You know, like I saw you in the meeting the other day, you really stood out. Like what you said was really impactful for the group. And that because they don't know, it becomes more impactful than if they knew who it was. And then, you know, this is probably a talk or maybe a book in the future we can design events for large groups of people that create these kinds of experiences. So I've literally been on the phone yesterday 
with the YPO group in Dubai, and we're going to create an experience for 40 families. And so here's what we're going to do. I'll tell you real quick. So we're going to create some risk, some uncertainty, some uniqueness, some beauty, some emotional intensity, and some flow state. We're going to put them on buses with windows all blacked out. They don't know where they're going. They're not told. We're going to take them out into the desert, into the sand. So they're going to get dumped off. The bus driver is going to run away. They're not going to know what to do. There's going to be some indicator that they need to cross this big dune. So they're going to climb up this big sand dune in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing around. And they're going to crest the ridge just as the sun is setting. And they see this long table, 80 seats long, all lit up with candles and lights and a dinner ready to go. And the music will start. And then they're going to have a great meal in the middle of nowhere in the desert. And then, not to let everything get too safe and comfortable, midway through dinner, we're going to have the lights go out. We're going to have a bunch of people come running over the tops of the other dunes, screaming. Everybody's going to freak out for about five seconds. And then that's going to be the music and fire dancer performance. Lights will go back on. They'll realize they're safe. They'll do that. And then I'll speak about the nature of time and how these things work together. So we're going to design that for 80 plus people. Absolutely. More in our working lives if they're not very fulfilling. But we, we have to take the agency on for ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, getting back to one of the funnest, easiest things to do, even with your spouse, is, hey, we're going out tonight. Where are we going? You'll find out when we get there. Like, just don't tell, you know? And, you know, you run the risk of something going off the rails every once in a while. You know, the place you're taking them isn't where they want them to go. But that's, that's, the, that's the price of uncertainty. <laughs> <laughs> at the Boston Museum of Art. Okay. <laughs> it's three hour exhibition um, okay. about the sensuality of jello and it's our, and it's meaning in our society. Interesting. And you know, I mean, if we have no idea what we're getting into. <laughs> Right. And, you know, to be fair, it's probably not unsafe. So you're probably not going to be killed. No. So at worst, you're going to be like, remember that stupid idea I had to go to the Jello thing? Like, <laughs> even that's memorable, right? Right, 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 right. Well, I tell you, I hope that everyone listening to this episode takes away some pearls about getting out there, taking some risk, looking for uh, uniqueness, beauty, and emotional intensity, and, and, and embraces it. Thank you well so, so much for these insights. John Quayle, how can people connect with your work and what should they do next to make sure that this, this ride they're on keeps going? Uh, so um, my website is johnkcoyle.com, so super easy, or speakingdesignthinking.com. They have the same place. I've got a blog there. I've got five TEDx talks, links to that. I've got my books that I've been working on. And so, yeah, and if you ever need to book a speaker, this is what I do for a living. And so I'd be delighted to come speak to your company or your group if that is a need of yours. So that is lovely. Added. I can highly re recommend John. I've now spent about three hours with him and he is one of the most delightful people I've ever had the opportunity to spend time with. So thank you, John Quayle. I hope that all the connections to goodness and progress that John and I have talked about will carry you through your week and you will start finding all the joy and wonder in the passage of time that we've been talking about. Thanks, John. Thank you, Linda. <laughs>